it should be recording. Okay. Yes. Well, good evening, everyone. Again, sorry about that. It, sometimes you have to just kind of look around and find things on Zoom because it moves you around. But as I was saying, it's really great to be with you tonight uh, to do a presentation on trees. Um, you know, trees, I'm going to a little bit, I'll provide so many benefits. But uh, kind of to help organize tonight to help keep us on track and everything. For those who are not familiar with the Zoom, there is a, a chat feature. You know, there's a little button at the bottom of your screen. There's a little taskbar that pops up that has like mute your mic, video on. Uh, you can see the number of participants. But then there's also a, a feature called chat. And if you have questions while we're going through tonight, uh, you want to tap, uh, type them into the chat box. And then Mark's going to kind of view that over as I present tonight. And if there's something pertinent at the time I'm talking about it, and you want to ask a question, that's probably the best way to do it. If not, we will also save some time at the end of the session to just open it up for open discussion, open questions. So that gives you two opportunities to participate because we we're in live meeting in a room. I would encourage you to raise your hand, ask a question the whole way through. Because I tell you what, after Zooming, uh, this is my uh, third Zoom uh, presentation in the last uh, two days. I've got another three hour one again tomorrow. So uh, it, it sometimes gets hard to, uh, to, to talk to yourself in, in a screen in a room. So it's nice to have some interaction. I see I got a message that someone raised their hand. I don't know if there's already a question mark or not, or just someone's asking for clarification. Okay. Roseanne, do you have a question or are you just... Uh... Okay, guess not. And then I'm gonna, maybe she's just testing out. A lot of people try out all the little fun buttons on Zoom. Uh, yeah, they're, they're kind of fun. So we're gonna get started with tonight's presentation on, on trees. Uh, for I, I came to City Prairie Village for this area. Uh, you know, everyone has their personal preferences on what they like, they don't like, those type of things. I have to tell you that I'm in the boat of a lot of you. Uh, I had lived in a home that my front yard tree was a tree, and I made the decision not to treat the tree, and I had, to, had it removed two years ago, and, and trust me, I kind of felt like uh, sometimes you know the doctor who knows more about the illness and they really want to know. Well, I was kind of like the tree doctor that knew more about every tree than I really wanted to know. And I really struggled with, with finding the, the right tree to replace uh, my only one tree in the front yard. Because we know trees provide so many benefits for us. Uh, you know, proven fact that, you know, well landscaped, mature trees can help increase the value of your home. You know, we have wind protection, I have the, breaking those uh, winter winds will help both uh, winter heating. You know, shading effect, you know, 10 to 15 degrees cooler in, in the summer months. You know, we don't think about some of the other intrinsic benefits of trees, like how they filter dust, um, the sound buffer, how much oxygen, you know, uh, they produce filtering out carbon dioxide and other um, contaminants, pollutants in our air. Uh, you know, the water, uh, soil erosion, um, you know, a tree canopy will help that water slow, uh, fall slower to the ground, help with the flash flooding, those type more intrinsic benefits. And of course, the wildlife habitat uh, of the songbirds, uh, the insects and everything that kind of makes a healthy environment goes with trees. Of course, when it comes to all trees, not all trees are created equal when it comes to wildlife habitat. That's where the push you see for a lot more of our native trees come into play uh, because they will uh, potentially host more insects and more native uh, uh, wildlife, as opposed to what we call an exotic tree or one that's of an Asian descent or something like that, that maybe doesn't have quite as much benefit. And, you know, no presentation on trees would be complete without the old saying, the right tree, right place. And I like to add the third right in the right way, which is the right planting. And all of these are probably another uh, discussion lecture in itself. But so we really, for the most part, want to plant that tree for long-term survival. We need to direct, select trees uh, in accordance to our soil types. That's why even though Prairie Village is full of pin oaks, you will not see me recommending a pin oak tonight uh, because of our high pH soils. We tend to have a lot of problems with iron chlorosis, especially in the new construction in the south and west. You know, a lot of us are looking more for drought uh, tolerance, 
tolerance. Um, you know, in the cities, we've got to worry about the height of utility lines uh, so we don't interfere with, with uh, electricity, those type of things. Um, you know, the spread, the distance from structure, uh, and just proper spacing all around for, for healthy trees. And we're not going to get into the in planting, because like I said, that would be a whole nother discussion. We're going to focus more on replacement trees and just assume you all um, have a good understanding of how to plant trees. You know, I get this question all the time, well, well how long does a tree last? And, you know, I, I always go back to, you know, the, the old saying when you're in elementary school and you ask, well, how long does that paper need to be? And, you know, I'd hear the teacher say, how long is a piece of string? And you go, well, I don't know how long. Well, long enough to do the job. You know, so it, it kind of goes back to, to this kind of statement here, you know, in the, in the fourth, oh my gosh, that tree will last for maybe hundreds of years or even longer. But you put that in an urban man-made environment, that life expectancy decreases drastically. You know, uh, research statistics I found, you know, a typical residential city street may only last 32 years. Now, I know you've got some in Prairie Village that have been there since the, the dawn of the city, so to speak, which is what, 60, 70 plus years still going strong, but also you're starting to see some of those original trees start to age out, you know, because you get all the issues with sidewalks and street construction, sewer construction, uh, utility easements, lines, everything just short. And those trees you see stuck out in those poor little islands and plantings and parking lots, you know, if they last 10, seven to 10 years, uh, average, that, that, that's a really good life for a tree. And trees have functions in our landscape. You know, they enframe the house, you know, set it off. They're, they're background trees. That means it, it kind of breaks the roof line of the house, ties that uh, house to the property. Of course, screening bad views. You can only think of evergreens for that. And, you know, accent. That would be when a tree's in flower or something to draw attention to our home. And so here's kind of a little landscape, uh, you know, typical home here. Uh, the screening trees would be these little circles all the way around the back. These enframe trees would be the one off to the front and the side of the house, kind of putting your focus on the house. You know, small little enframe tree. And I'm not going to talk about really, really small, you know, niche trees tonight, but we do that. And here are the background trees. And of course, shade always comes into play too, which is not listed on here. But all these trees could also be that shade tree also in, in our landscape. Let me put the game down. And a lot of people will kind of have discussions or debates on, well, what is a small tree? What is a medium tree? And, and it's going to vary depending on, on the person and you're talking to. Uh, I kind of go with 30 feet or less, kind of 30 to 60, and then large trees 60 or over. And honestly, in our wind soil types, we don't have truly a lot of 60 plus trees. Um, you know, so some people might change that to 25 feet, 50 feet, 50 plus. You know, I really don't think it matters. It's kind of a bucket to kind of lump things in. So don't get hung up so much on that, except when you're really working with high line wires, utilities, those type of things. And the other question that we get all the time is well, what is the, the growth rate of a tree? You know, how fast? You know, everyone wants that big tree uh, today. They don't want to wait till tomorrow. So everyone wants to plant this fast growing tree. And so as a rule of thumb, if it's a really fast growing tree, it's probably going to put on, you know, three feet of growth a year. Mediums maybe a, a foot to three foot a year. And then slow would be kind of a foot or less a year. And so here's the drawbacks, pluses or minuses. A fast growing tree, like a cottonwood, those type of things, we normally associate fast growing trees with being more weak wooded. In other words, their structure, their strength of the wood just does not usually stand up to wind, ice, snowstorms, those type of things. We normally think of those slower growing trees as having harder, denser wood that's gonna be more resistant to breaking up in a storm. But here's, here's the really good news, you know, back to the right tree, right, play, right place, right way. You can take a slower growing tree and with as simple as removing the grass competition away from it from three to four feet out for the first five, 10 years of life or longer, you can probably double the growth rate of that tree over that 10 year period. 
So for example, you could take it, what's usually listed as a slow growing ginkgo, good cultural practices, get that grass away, fertilize, love it, care for it. You could turn that into a medium growth rate tree and still have all the properties of a good, hard, strong wooded tree. The other issue is usually the faster the tree grows, shorter the life expectancy of the tree. The harder the wood, the, the medium to slower growing, the expectancy of the tree. So there's kind of a trade-off there. So I, I, are there any questions on kind of that background information? Or if not, we'll go ahead and move into to some tree talk. OK, I think there are no questions. And yep, there are no. So we'll just go ahead and move in. And we're just going to kind of go over a smorgasbord of trees. The link for you, but on our website, uh, and I'll give it to you at the end, we do have a, a publication called Recommended Trees for, for Kansas City. And probably the easiest, quickest way to get that in is just type in Recommended Trees Kansas City and then Johnson County Extension, and it should pop right up into your Google feed. And most of this information I have is going to be in that. So just uh, Recommended Trees Kansas City, Johnson County Extension in your, in your search engine and it should pop right up. So let's just kind of go down the list, look at some trees. You know, this is gonna be kind of this, this kind of show of this, this, this. So I'm gonna try to go quickly and leave your questions, but still hopefully give you some, some feedback and interest uh, of trees to select. Uh, Dennis, we do have one question on the yes. growth rate. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. David would like to know if mulch around a tree is fine just no grass for fast growth. Does mulch impact or grass impact growth of a tree? Yeah, so, so my comment was research has shown that if you leave the grass competition up to the trunk of the tree versus removing it out three, four feet away and then adding two to three inches of mulch, even actually just bare with no mulch, but we usually recommend mulch. Over a 10 year period, you can double the growth rate of the tree. That grass is just so competitive. And the other really main issue with grass up around the base of the tree is in our zeal or zest to nick back every blade of grass, we hit it with a lawnmower, we hit it with a weed whip, and then you end up with all these injuries to the base of the tree that impedes water nutrient movement. And you would not believe the number of images we receive at our gardening hotline that is, is what I would call mower-itis, string trimmer-itis. It's just, um, just damage that's there for a lifetime will never heal itself over. Okay, so the first tree we're going to talk about is most people already know, uh, flowering crab. Um, actually, there there are some uh, wild crabs native down in southeast Kansas, so you could, in some way, depending on the definition of native plants. Uh, consider the malice species a, a native tree to, to Kansas. Um, there's been so much research done over the last 20, 30 years on this tree. You can see a whole list of varieties there. What, if you're going to plant a crab apple, I really think it's back to do you like pink flowers, white flowers, red flowers, green foliage, purple flowers. There's just so many options there. And as far as size, you know, they're on the board, all across the board from some little, like what I call little lollipop trees to ones will get 20 feet or more tall. Some are more vase shaped, some are more spreading. Uh, but what you really wanna look for are apple, crab apples that are resistant to cedar apple rust and apple scab. Those by far are two major disease problems. And pretty much any of the modern varieties or some of these out on the market are all gonna be resistant to those diseases. Uh, you know, old, old crab apple varieties, there's one called Hopa, which is a gorgeous flowering, but probably by August it didn't have a leaf on it. Um, so uh, you're here again, uh, pick, pick, pick what you like. Uh, I think there's a lot of options here. Uh, some of them have fruit that are very uh, ornamental. Uh, a lot of them that have fruit now have what they call persistence, so they don't necessarily drop off and cause a mess. They either get eaten by wildlife or they just kind of mummify, dry up on, on the tree and then drop off uh, in the winter months. Redbud is another great tree, and I think redbud's probably a good tree uh, for up in northeast Johnson County, where we tend to have a lot of large canopy trees. 
because redbud really in its native habitat is, is right on the edge of the forest. It's really not a tree that wants to be stuck out on a planting island with full hot blazing sun. It really likes to have a little bit more of that, uh, you know, morning sun, afternoon shade with a filtered light. Uh, you're gonna get a longer life expectancy out of that tree. Uh, of course, you know, up in the upper corner, there's the white buds, you get the white color. Uh, and so these Eastern red buds are our native trees, but they're <coughs> getting all these breeding uh, lines coming in, you know, Oklahoma red bud is really technically not native here in Kansas, it's more in Oklahoma, um, but it's got the red, uh, you know, uh, b a much more bright pink uh, flower to it. You get like forest pansy that has this purple foliage. And now all the rage in red buds are all these uh, yellow leafed red buds. Uh, Rising Sun is one of the more common varieties. Um, the, the more ornamental the characteristic of red bud, probably the less adaptable it is. They, they bred some of the what I call durable hardiness out of it as they've uh, uh, changed some of the genetics of the tree with research. But you know, a nice little yellow leaf tree in the spring certainly gives a pop of color. Uh, and you still get the pink blooms uh, on those uh, yellow leaf type varieties. There's also weeping varieties out there too. They tend to be fairly susceptible to borers and a little bit short, shorter lived, but certainly gives you that cascading effect. Uh, you know, my favorite place to go in the spring in Johnson County is up in the Northeast area because all the beautiful dogwoods and azaleas and rhododendrons because your soils have had, you know, years to repair themselves uh, were great. You know, dogwood is also native to Southeast Kansas. Um, and it is really a true understory tree. Here again, it's not one that's gonna wanna go out in the blazing hot sun. I, I live down South and, uh, you know, dogwoods are few and far between there because we just don't have that canopy of trees to give that understory effect to dogwood. The white by and large tends to be the easiest to grow the pink neck, the red, what's called the red flowering, which is really more of a dark pink, tend to be a little bit harder to get going in our climate. They like more an acidic soil and we tend to be higher pH. If you have a more sun location and still like that kind of dogwood look, uh, you might want to look at Kusa dogwood. Uh, Kusa is non-native, it's, it's an Asian species. Uh, it's a nice little small 15 foot tree. Uh, it can get uh, some nice little red uh, fruit on it. Um, and it's also a full sun tree, and it's going to bloom much later. When, when I look for a flowering tree, this is just me personally, it's everyone's taste. You know, I almost get overloaded with everything blooming, you know, the crab apples, the ornamental pears, which are not on this list, uh, the red buds, all come in that early spring period. So I like to look for something that's going to bloom into May, June, and this is what the box, the Coosa Dogwood's going to uh, to, uh, to check. It's probably a May, June bloomer. Uh, and, and like I said, where the uh, Florida, the, the other dogwood is almost a shade lover, this one's going to take full sun. And another fun uh, little spring blooming tree is another dogwood called the Cornelian cherry dogwood, or some people call it cornice moss after its name. Uh, this one blooms yellow. It's actually, we have it out in our demonstration garden here at the office. And it and the witch hazel are the two earliest plants in the garden to bloom. Um, it's not, you know, that wow, knock your socks off kind of color, but uh, you get the yellow uh, flowers before the leaves come out. And, and then occasionally you get the little red fruit that the birds will devour. But what I like about it, it's a fairly nice compact 15 foot tree. The picture here kind of shows it more as a large shrub. And if it's not trained properly early on, it could be just an overgrown looking shrub. But if you get a nice trunk put on it, it really makes a nice kind of rounded up, up, uh, upward growing head, uh, probably about the size of a red bud crab apple is what it's gonna top out about. So it's a little bit different with the yellow flower color because you don't have a lot of early spring yellow flowers, more the whites, the pinks early on. Another one uh, is the Canada red choke cherry. It's not my favorite tree. Um, it, it comes out green, but then it has the purple leaf color, which is what people gravitate for with the white flowers. Rarely do we see fruit. Uh, and a lot of times people want a small tree with purple uh, summer color, and we don't have a lot of options. We have this one, we have Japanese maple, and we have the Newport plum, which is an extremely short-lived tree. Probably the, the main issue with this tree is it, it can tend to sucker. And, and it can really sucker really bad. I've seen some where there's like almost a thicket 
uh, of trees and uh, of, of shoots. Coming up. And you know, moving a bit later into bloom is golden rain tree. Uh, this one, some people do not like for a couple of reasons. It can reseed itself. It's become what I would call invasive in our climate, and which means it's out into the native woods. But you will get seedlings popping up in your yard. But the nice thing about it is here again, you probably have a June blooming tree, uh, nice round head, very dense. Uh, a lot of people don't like the, the brown dry seed pods, but, but it is a nice tree. Um, it can also attract box elder bugs in the fall. So I guess I keep, you know, here again, I know too much all the inside and out about the tree, but it, but it is a nice, nice tree that, that is, does give you a little bit season uh, difference of, of color. Unfortunately, a lot of these don't have, what I've talked about so far, don't have really a lot of fall color. Though. And the fringe tree. Um, it's one of my favorite trees. Now, there is some reports out there. It could be all susceptible to the emerald ash borer. Um, there, there's two species out there, the American and then the, the Chinese. We have both of these in our demonstration garden here at our office uh, at 119th and Ridgeview in Olathe. And I will tell you that the Chinese fringe tree, the non-native one to the U.S., in my estimation, is the prettier of the two trees. It tends to flower better, and it tends to have a lot prettier bark. Um, both of them we have in our gardens are multi-stemmed trees. So there's, I think, three trunks on each of them. Um, but but uh, both of them would, would be acceptable for our climate. Um, the American does have a little bit more pollinator habitat than, than the Chinese. But like I said, I think comparing the two side by side, and just had a look at the trees, look at the varieties, you would probably say, ooh, I, I, would, I would go with the Chinese variety because it does tend to flower a little bit better. And of course, most of us are familiar with Japanese maples. Uh, here again, you can have anything from a little four or five foot plant to a much larger. Uh, the one that most people use as a small tree is the variety blood good maple. Uh, 15 feet tall, 15 feet wide. Uh, not a really good specimen here in the picture, but uh, it is a nice, it will take, it is a nice understory tree, and it will also take quite a bit of sun. It, it can almost take full sun. Uh, if it's good moisture, it, it would do just fine. And here again, it would tick that box for that uh, summer purple uh, leaf color. Couple trees that you may not be familiar with that would be in that small, you know, slash medium category is Acer Campestri, which is a hedge maple. Um, there are small little maples. Most people are just familiar with red maple and, and sugar maple and silver maple, but there's a lot of these more smaller maples, small to medium size, that are nice trees for us. Uh, Evelyn is one, Queen Elizabeth is the hedge maple that's the most common on the market. Fall color may not be quite as outstanding as some of the other species, but uh, it is a very hardwooded, durable tree. And you see in the picture there, it makes just a nice little shade tree, ornamental tree uh, in, in your landscape. And another one that's gained popularity is the Shantung maple. Uh, here again, kind of in that small, medium category. Uh, you see several varieties on the market, the Norwegian sunset, crimson sunset, and, and this one's touted for its, its fall color. Uh, reds, yellows, uh, depending on the species, you, you get some nice fall color, you get a nice glossy leaf. Uh, very durable, hardy tree for our area. Um, and in some of the areas of Prairie Village where you got some really tighter areas with, with development and other trees, you know, some of these smaller maples are probably a better fit for your development than maybe some of the larger maple, like the sugar maple, red maple, those type of things. Then the third one in this group is going to be the, the trident maple, uh, which has kind of that, that tri-lobed uh, leaf, uh, the common variety. Uh, here again, that, you know, probably in that medium to small range, but it's also noted for its nice red uh, fall. So all these maples are good, smaller maples. Unfortunately, they're sometimes a little bit more difficult to find in the trade, but they are they are nice trees for the for the landscape. And Japanese tree lilac, this one's getting to be very commonly known. It, it is in the lilac family. It doesn't have wonderful odor like the, the spring blooming purple lilacs, but it's a nice rounded upright tree in that 20 to 25 foot range. 
ivory silk tends to be the best cultivar. Uh, and here again, it blooms a month, probably into May or so is when the bloom time is. So you get past that, that really early uh, blush, blush of color to give you another season of, of color in the landscape. Uh, just a golden yellow fall color. Uh, Dennis, we have yes. a... I guess this is... Uh, Dennis, could you, okay. uh, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Mark. I was going to suggest if, uh, if you... We're getting a couple of, of requests asking people to make sure your microphone is uh, muted as we're getting quite a bit of background noise from some folks. Yeah, I'll go through two real quick here and see if I can mute some of these uh, individuals that are not muted. So it looks like we're doing... Okay, it looks like we're doing much better now. So that's great. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. That is one of the drawbacks to Zoom. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so then kind of winding down the small tree is service berry. Um, there are some native service berries in our area. This one, the, the one we see most, the Grand Flora, is not native, but it is still probably one of the best uh, wildlife plants we have. And it's a, kind of a truly a, a three season plant. Uh, so you have very early spring flowers before the leaves come out. And you can see followed up by green berries that turn red and they turn purple. And then you have the nice red uh, fall color. And I have one of these in my yard. And as soon as those berries start to get a blush of color, there are robins, birds all over it. And those berries are cleaned up and gone in a day or two. Um, the fruit are also edible. If you ever heard of a Saskatoon berry or Amalanker uh, jelly, um, that's what it's made out is service berry. And in fact, uh, some people grow this just for the berries, but uh, I grow it for the, the flowers, the berries, and the fall color. A lot of times you see it as a multi-stem, but you can also see it uh, trained in a single stem, depending on, on the variety or species. And then probably my favorite tree, but definitely non-native, but is this Seven Suns tree. Uh, it just finished blooming in our demonstration garden last week with these white flowers. And uh, we had a group come out and do monarch tagging and they took over 20 monarchs off that tree in an hour period and tagged them for monarch watch. And it is also a wonderful host to all the native little bees, wasps, solitary uh, pollinators. Um, so it's a great, great uh, pollinator plant. So once it's done turning white, then the sepals turn pink. And so you have another season of color in September, October. And then and sometimes it's called the crepe merle of the north because you get exfoliating, peeling bark. Um, it, it's kind of a gnarly looking tree at a young age. And you have to do some work kind of to train it to look, uh, to get it really looking great. But it really does develop into a really nice tree. Uh, the other nice specimen, if you ever go down to the Kaufman Gardens on the plaza, there's one kind of over the, the graves of the Kaufman. Uh, it is another really nice specimen of the Seven Suns tree. And of course, if you're familiar with the magnolias, uh, the saucer types, uh, the pink flowering. And there's lots of these up in, in Northeast Johnson County. They get a little bit larger. They kind of can get a little, at old age, kind of a little gnarly looking. Um, there's what's called the little girl series, which tends to be smaller, the little hybrids I, I got there, maybe in the 10 to 20 foot range, as opposed to the old saucer that could be 20 to 30. There's some yellow flowered ones out there, butterflies, a few others, if you want something a little different in your landscape. And then another fun tree is really for that kind of enframement or accent or is sweet bag magnolia. It's a, it's a, a semi evergreen. It'll hold its leaves later into the season. Uh, and problem when we get some really cold, nasty weather. But those flowers are probably the size of a teacup and they're extremely fragrant. It's not gonna be knock your socks off when it's in flower, but it's gonna be a half a dozen here or there for about a, a month or so. And, and usually see this as a single stem plant. It will also take little boggy areas too. So you have a wet area. This might be a little niche tree that you could work in there. And then uh, one of my other favorite trees is Bracken's Brown Beauty Magnolia. This is, is a, 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 a sport of the Southern, well, not sport, but, but taken off of the Southern Magnolia, which you see down in Texas, you know, Arkansas, um, these big old trees that are 30, 40, 50 feet tall and wide. But we have Bracken's Brown, which is a more cold hardy variety, maybe 30 feet, 15 feet wide. As you see in the lower left photo, very um, brown underneath 
uh, it's evergreen. Uh, and then the blooms are probably the size of a salad plate uh, when they open up and extremely fragrant. And then you'll get the seed pod that develops and these will open up and uh, get a little bit of red seed in there and give a little bit of other color. Uh, so it's a nice evergreen tree because it is more narrow upright. You could use it for screen, you could use it for framement. There's several different uses for it. Okay, are there any me small tree questions before we move on to the next section? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a, a no and, and keep moving on then to our medium tree so we can kind of stay on, stay on schedule here and get you out by eight o'clock. So uh, a lot of these, like I said, kind of cross over, but uh, linden tree, um, beautiful tree, uh, Fairly fast growing. Uh, it is native to, to here again, Eastern, Southeast Kansas. Um, probably the drawback to the lindens are, are, are two. One is Japanese beetles love them uh, and they'll defoliate them, but the good news is they come back and controlling Japanese beetles is fairly difficult. Uh, some people love the flowers because they're extremely fragrant, almost to the fragrant point of nauseating uh, and then also they, they draw all sorts of pollinators when they are in flower. And then there's also little leaf linden, tends to be a little bit tighter, more compact tree, but also a, a, a nice shade tree to us. And unfortunately, both of these tend to be um, fed on by Japanese maples or excuse me, Japanese beetles. So lindens are kind of losing favor in, in our climate because of that issue. And of course, our good old friend Ginkgo, um, one of the Butter yellow fall colors. Uh, you want to make sure you get a, a male selection because the female produces a fruit that can smell like, well, let's just say every dog in the neighborhood decided to come visit your yard uh, all on the same day and no one picked it up for weeks. Uh, and there's a couple varieties out there. Uh, there's even some columnar uprights and fit some really narrow areas. It's the only, you know, parallel vein leaf we have. And if you're the type of person that gets tired of leaves dropping over a several week period, Ginkgo has this uncanny ability that it'll drop like every leaf like in two or three hours. When it decides it's time to shed, it just drops them all. And so if you're that type of person that wants to be one time out there and done, you might want to look at Ginkgo. Probably the, the biggest knock on it is it tends to be a little bit slower growing. And a lot of people do not like common hackberry. Uh, it's just our native tree. It, it doesn't do a lot. Uh, it's starting to get a nice yellow fall color now. Uh, it does have the little uh, berry seed on it. Um, at a maturity, it can be prone to some canker issues, those type of things. But, you know, it's for the most part a very durable, a hardwooded tree. Uh, what pest problems it does have tend to be secondary. Uh, and it's just a tree you don't think about planting much, uh, but it does. It is host to several species of butterflies um, that feed on it, painted ladies, a hackberry uh, caterpillar, and a few others. Uh, and, and so if you got a, an area that's, you know, kind of more native, you're not gonna water, not gonna take care of it. You just need something that thrives day in and day out. You might wanna look at our old hackberry uh, that we see all over our woods in, in this part of the country. Another one of our native trees is honey locust. Um, what we find in the trade are the ones without the big thorns. And we try to get varieties that are also fruitless so we don't have these big pods that hang down. Uh, to me, the, the nice thing about honey locust is it's got a compound leaf, but each of those leaflets is probably about the size of a little pinky nail. And they, they almost disappear. You don't, in other words, you don't have a lot of leaf litter with honey locust. Um, you just get kind of a butter yellow fall color but you also don't have to worry about big old oak leaves and things like that piling up in your yard with honey locust. And the other nice thing is it's open enough that you're gonna get enough sunlight coming through that it's not gonna have any problems with trying to grow grass under the trees. And some of these other ones are so dense, it's impossible to grow grass. And another fun native tree is Kentucky coffee tree. Definitely want to get the espresso uh, pod list because um, it gets named coffee tree because settlers made a coffee out of the beans in them. And these beans are, oh my gosh, big, thick, fleshy pods. Um, and, and if you have ever seen, you know, like the Charlie Brown Halloween creepy tree, um, it's probably a Kentucky coffee tree because it has a very coarse texture, doesn't have a lot of branches to it. 
Uh, and so it gives a very unique look during the winter because of that, that, that coarse uh, kind of gnarly texture to it. It's probably the last tree of the leaf out in the spring, but, but it is a nice durable tree for our area. Lace bark elm, I, I still have this in here, but it breaks up pretty bad under wind and snow. In fact, just here, what was it last uh, year, uh, winter, we had a, a little snowstorm come through and it broke up pretty bad. Uh, people like lace bark elm because of the exfoliating bark, gives you a nice texture, but I, I, I'm kind of taking it down on my list because it does tend to break up more and more. Norway maple, I, I still think it's a good tree for our area. It's listed on the invasive list on both the east and west coast. Uh, you get that purple leaf with crimson king. There's several others, it's a little bit slower growing, but it's definitely a very hard, hard wooded maple. Of course, sugar maple, uh, you know, you see these up in, in your neck of the woods. Uh, I still think it's a great tree for us. Uh, there are a number of different introductions on the market now that have much thicker, glossier leaves that tend to stand up to wind and, and our heat a little bit more. And probably uh, sugar maple is probably going to be the tree you're going to get the best color out, especially going for the oranges and the reds and maybe some purples. Uh, but there's several varieties uh, of what we call these caddo maples that a lot of research was done by K-State down in the Wichita area out of seedlings out of Oklahoma. But if you look at sugar maple, definitely look at some of these varieties. The variety of Oregon Trail is from Hiawatha, Kansas, just to the north of us. So you see there that you've got, um, you know, some local roots uh, coming in, in this tree. Uh, number of oaks, you know, I'm going to kind of say ditto a lot of these oaks because they basically do the same thing, but some of the ones you may not recognize are, are sawtooth oak. If you look at the leaf picture really close, you can see these little projections coming off each leaf. That's why they get its name sawtooth oak. So if you're wanting something different than the average person has, here, here's a few to look at. Sawtooth oak, uh, shingle oak is our native tree. Uh, they used to make shingles out of it, hence the name shingle oak. Unfortunately, all these do have acorns. They tend to hold their leaves, so they're not maybe as easy to, to clean, those type of things. Another fun one is willow oak um, out there on the market. So you're getting one something a bit different. And now we're gonna wrap up real quick. I'm gonna move through these a little fast and I'm running out of time, not too much at the start. Um, you know, American elm is back. You know, we lost most of our American elms to Dutch elm disease, but through research, they found some true uh, uh, American elms and then they've also crossbred uh, American elms with some other uh, species of elms to get some of these uh, resistance. So you get back that nice base-shaped elm, you know, that used to line our streets when they were planted in the 50s out there. And, and so don't, don't be afraid to go back with some of these newer varieties of elm and, and kind of recapture our, our kind of our first classic suburban street tree was the American elm. Old cypress. Um, it's probably the best tree if you've got a really wet area. It'll also do really well in a dry area. It is a deciduous conifer. So the, the seed here in the center is actually a cone. Uh, it has a beautiful, what I call rust fall color. My people say, well, rust isn't that exciting, but it really is a pretty orangish brown. Drawback in wet areas, you can get the cypress knees, which can present a problem for tripping, um, mowing, those type of things. But uh, like I said, wet area would be its, 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 uh, its uh, advantage. If we got a sunk pump or something dumping out, might be a tree to look at. Our, our classic you know, tree and probably our most beautiful tree we have in Kansas is the Baroque. It's a I huge like that thing. I'm not for sure if I, I see it fitting well into a smaller prairie village lot, but there's nothing prettier than a than a majestic bur oak tree. So I had, to, I had to put it in there just from that standpoint. So if you own property out or something, you want a little arboretum, definitely put a bur oak in it. Uh, if you need an oak more narrow upright, English oak, uh, the commoner oak, uh, it's, yeah. it's a nice uh, upright tree. If, under the right condition, you get some nice red fall color with it also. That's cool, I didn't know there was one. That's and um, so if you don't want to be hurt, be sure to mute your mic. And then, of course, red oak has been around. There's, there's a number of these up in Prairie Village area uh, with pin oak, looks a lot like it. Um, sometimes you will get the nice red fall color. Uh, sometimes it just goes brown. You know, so far with the weather patterns we've had, you know, sunny, rain, cool, uh, hopefully we're setting up to have a really nice fall color. If we get a really hard freeze, that's going to be our, our downfall potentially for fall color this year. 
Swamp White Oak is, is probably the, the flavor of the day tree down south in new development. Uh, it kind of, you know, we went um, American Elm, we went Ash, we went Red Maple. Now the flavor for street development and new developments is a Swamp White Oak. Uh, very durable. It's very uh, tolerant of our heavy compacted soils um, and, and, and grows quite nicely for it. But it, it's probably going to be a little overplanted. So I'd look at maybe some of the other oaks. Schumard's another nice, fun oak. Um, it, it's native. You don't know, see Schumard as much, but it is another nice oak for our area, as is white oak. Okay, any questions on deciduous trees before I just hit a few evergreens and we, we call it a night? Hey, Dennis, we did have uh, one question from Kevin about the, uh, what about the spring flurry service berry? Which was, you cut out again, the, the service berry? Uh, the spring flurry service berry. I'm not as familiar with that variety, uh, but most of those service berries are, are, are pretty nice trees. Uh, so that's definitely one I would definitely look at. I just, I'm, I'm not, I have not grown or, or, or done a lot of research on that particular variety. <laughs> We've got a, another question from Frank. Are all elms susceptible to storm breakage, even American? American elm tends to be better than lace bark elm. Um, lace bark tends to have a more relaxed habit and thus they, they tend to stab a little bit more. Uh, I, I would put a, a, an American elm well above um, a, 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 a lace bark elm. And we've got one question from David. I think it's coming up on your next uh, uh, section on evergreen trees, but uh, he says, it's good to see the next topic. My 30 foot scotch pines in the backyard perimeter look great, provided a ton of privacy, but were recently eaten alive by pine will. Yeah. Um, which similar evergreen trees might you recommend to take their place that would be fast growing, provide privacy, will not fall victim to the same disease? So let's go through this section and see if that answers this question. If not, we can come back and revisit. How about that? Okay. Sounds good. Cool. Okay. So let's look at some evergreen trees here real quick. Keep in mind, Kansas is the only state of all 50 states that does not have a native pine. Uh, so pines stress in our area because of insect disease and our different issues. So, um, you're not going to see a lot of pine recommendations. No scotch, no Austrian, those type of things. So, so a few things to look at for evergreens. Um, you know, the Arborvita, these are the small little like the, the Groot Emerald Arborvita. Uh, you see that screen patios, uh, hide areas, um, would not be a big tree. Like I said, some of these are only maybe three feet wide at most, very stove pipe. So they make a nice screen border, those type of things. The issue with these is that they don't have a lot of heat or drought tolerance. So you definitely need to make sure that they stay well watered, uh, even during what I call a mild drought period. I think the tree that I would recommend a lot of people gravitate to as opposed to the Scotch pine is this one here, the Green Giant Arborvita. Um, it's relatively fast growing. Um, it's very cone shape, as you can see. Um, so it doesn't give you a lot of protection up high, but down, down low it does. It's, it's, it's probably two times tall as wide, uh, which is nice, so it fits some areas. Um, the knock on this tree, uh, if it's really hot and dry, you better keep the water on it. Uh, mm -hmm. Back when we had the really hot spell in 2012-13, a lot of these burn up and died, but ones that were well irrigated did just fine. Uh, so I think this is probably one of the trees I'd look at for replacing Scotch pine with. The other would be some sort of juniper, which is our true native evergreen in this part, or excuse me, native evergreen in this part of the country. Uh, you have the ones in the Chinese family, the Chinensis family of junipers like Kettler Eye, uh, Wintergreen, Robusta, those type of things. You have the ones in the true Eastern Red Cedar family, which are the ones you see growing out in the ditches all over here. Uh, you have several nice uh, varieties like Canarti, uh, and then Taylor is this really upright, narrow stovepipe. We have three in our demonstration garden, been there 10 years. They're probably, if they're three foot wide at most, and they're probably 15, 18 feet tall, and they're just like soldiers, that picture shows. Uh, so here again, it'd be a much more durable, heat drought tolerant plant than the Arborvita. The only knock on it, it is susceptible to bagworms. Uh, white pine, 
to me, it's a hit or a miss. Uh, I'd be cautious planting in your areas with better soils. I, I might be a, a more of a white pine fa a fan than I am out west or out west and south where it tends to have more issues with uh, our soils and our winds. And the Vanderwolf limber pine, I think is another nice niche pine. I'm not for sure if I'd put a, a, you know, a hedge of five, six, seven of these in to make a screen. Uh, I'm not for sure for the long haul if they're gonna be that durable in our climate, but they are more ornamental because they have a, a very nice soft gray underneath appearance to them. Um, uh, Vanderwolf is probably the most common variety you see out there in the market, but I think this would be where you make it more of a specimen in your backyard, those type of things, a front yard, as opposed to making a hedge or screen out of them. Blue spruce, my take on blue spruce is that you've got to love it. It's never going to be 100% heat drought tolerant in our areas. So we've always got to water it during a, a winter or a, or a dry spell and during the winter. The other thing I've noticed on this tree, you know, everyone wants this Christmas tree look like in the picture here. But as those trees age, get 20, 30 years old and 20, you know, 20, 30 feet high, they tend to open up a lot. Uh, they lose a lot of that inner growth. And so you kind of get this more weepy, straggly look to the tree. Because people call all the time and say, well, it doesn't look like it used to. Well, that's because it matures. If they just don't age gracefully, um, but, but as a young tree, um, looks great. And, and there are a lot of different varieties of spruce. I mean, there's out little toadstool ones to, to large ones. So the, the thing that's got going for it is that it's got that blue color, which you're not gonna really find that in any other plant. So it does tend to add another dimension to, to the landscape. And then of course you have the, the green version of the blue spruce, which does tend to be a little more heat and drought tolerant in our climate than, than the regular blue spruce. And then probably my favorite of all the spruces for a large, you know, kind of evergreen tree is the Norway spruce. Uh, if you drive around, you see more mature Norway spruces, larger and bigger than you probably do blue spruces. And there are probably, I'm going to guess, 10 to 20 blue spruces planted to every one Norway spruce. In fact, the, the state champion Norway spruce is in Overland Park off about 67th and uh, Metcalf area. And that, that sucker is huge. Uh, it fills up a side yard. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and, and they have a very nice weeping habit on the branches, but you're also going to find these weeping, uh, interesting dwarf forms too to add more interest to the landscape. And then you also get into some more niche trees that here again uh, are going to need some love. Uh, you know, the oriental and suburb uh, Serb uh, Serbian spruce like Riverside or Gowdy. Um, they're smaller, nice, nice evergreens, but here again, like the blue spruce, they're a tree you've got to love. Uh, you just can't put them out and forget them. You're going to have to water them during uh, stressful periods and, and just give a little bit more extra TLC to them. But they will provide some, some nice benefits in, in the landscape itself. So that is a very, very quick run through. Uh, if you're not familiar with Johnson County Extension, we are a part of Kansas State University. Our, our mission is to provide research-based education uh, we are tax uh, assisted uh, through both the state, federal, uh, and county level. Johnson County government is one of our main funders. And uh, you can use us in a number of different ways. We have all sorts of fact sheets and publications. Uh, I mentioned at the top, if you want our, the recommended tree list, I just kind of went through. Uh, just Google that and Johnson County Extension will pop up. Uh, we have an extension gardening hotline that our extension master gardener volunteers help us with. You can email us pictures, questions, you can call us, um, you know, we're open year round. Uh, and our job's here to help you make wise decisions so that you have a healthy landscape, a beautiful landscape that brings value and enjoyment and, mm -hmm. and enriches the, the community that you live in. And so, so we're a resource, we're here, use us. And with that, I'm going to stop and open it up to questions or, or uh, other comments. Uh, Dennis, uh, we've got a couple of uh, comments or questions on the chat. Um, Linda is mentioning that she's got a very large oak that she believes is dying from bacterial scorch leaf. She wants to plant another canopy tree in the front yard, uh, is interested in the bur oak, but is questioning if there is any other canopy tree that would be a good replacement. You know, uh, oaks have been having some problems up in the Prairie Village area. I didn't 
mentioned Oak Wilt, uh, which is, you, you can find uh, pockets there, uh, which is kind of like the Oak version of Dutch Elm disease. Um, there, there's not a lot of controls. There are some preventatives you can use, uh, but once again, it's pretty much removal of the tree. It tends to be worse in, in the, the red oak family, which are the pointed leaves. And then there tends to just be some secondary issues also, some leaf spots, those type of things, um, bot canker, that a lot of times are secondary and the trees will recover. Uh, and then I think also on a lot of those oaks I kind of mentioned earlier, and, and I know Bridget, uh, your, your city forester has done a lot of work uh, up in Prairie Village area um, on, on what's going on with the oaks. I think a lot of those trees are just aging out, especially as the, they're doing street repair, sewer repair, those type of things. Uh, you know, my challenge might be, it, since knowing Prairie Village has such a high population of, of red oak family, I, I might look for a white oak family member if I want, want to go with oaks, uh, which burr would be in that group. Uh, so it would be white oak, swamp white oak, those type of oaks. Or, or maybe look at another species of tree altogether to try to diversify uh, the urban canopy there. You know, it's really nice to have really no more than 10, 15% of any one tree species be in a neighborhood. And so that's why it's always nice to diversify. And that way, if something does move through, it doesn't wipe out the whole neighborhood. You know, I, I live in a development in South Overland Park, 214 homes, 214 green ash, 214 dead green ash. And it's all 25 to 30 years old and starting over. Kevin's got a couple uh, of questions. Are you, one is, are you familiar with the Southwestern white pine? And if so, uh, what do you know about it? Yeah, a lot of people will recommend South uh, West white pine over the pine astrobilis, the Eastern white pine, uh, especially as you move farther West in Kansas, where you drop a little bit moisture levels. Um, and actually that would be, I, I, would, I, would, I would have no problems planting that as opposed to the astrobilis. I think either one would work just fine. Uh, it tends to have a little bit maybe more resistance and disease problems. And I think that's actually what uh, Kansas Forest Service kind of recommends more is, is the, the, the southwest of the white pine. He's also asking, are there any disease resistant cultivars for the American elm that you're familiar with? Yeah, well, the ones I put on the slide here, uh, you know, Valley Forge, Patriot, Frontier, there, there's a number. Now, if you're looking for true, a true American elm, you're going to have to narrow your focus a bit more. A lot of these are hybrids of, of American elm and some other uh, species of elm. But at the end of the day, they pretty much look like American elm. But yeah, there's, there's three or four varieties out on the market now that are, are truly resistant uh, to Dutch elm disease. They, they work years to find, find that replacement. Joe is asking uh, if your website gives advice on grafted trees, something to use to screen just above the fence height, uh, thinking of privacy screen from the neighbor's elevated deck. So when I'm thinking of grafted trees, I'm a little <laughs> lost what he means by that. But I would look, you know, if he's trying to, you know, screen off a neighbor's deck, I'd look at some of those evergreens. Uh, maybe even like, you know, if it's a, a narrow area, you might look at brown, brown a magnolia. Uh, you might look at some of those upright junipers. If you've got more space, uh, you might look at some of those arborvita for some screens um, for, the, uh, for the neighbors. Um, I'm not sure exactly how tall, how wide the, the, the parameters are for those trees. Uh, I really like the brackens as a screen. Um, you know, put three, four of them together. It's almost a dense, dense wall. Uh, I have seen some issues with it breaking up into the snow and ice, but it tends to recover quite nicely. Connie's asking, uh, what preventative measures can be done for the oaks as a follow-up to the previous discussion on oaks? There can be some fungicide injections uh, that help with, uh, same, it's kind of same as what we do for the prevent Dutch elm disease. Uh, and you can, it's like every couple year injection of a, of a fungicide into the base of the tree. It's, it's costly, it's not a guarantee, but it is probably one of the, the few things you can do to help help with the, the oak wilt. If you've got it in your neighborhood, really prized tree, it might be something you want to check into. Mary uh, is mentioning that they have a beehive in their backyard. Uh, do you have any recommendations of trees that would keep bees happy? Well, you know, I think uh, when it comes to bees, I think it's the diversity. You know, I mentioned the linden certainly is a bee magnet when it's in flower. You know, all, all trees are only going to be in flower for about a week to two weeks, and that's it. 
So really, if you're trying to keep bees happy, I, I think it's more diversity. You know, do you look at something early spring like the crab apple, uh, the, the service berry, you know, something later? Uh, most of these trees that flower are going to be uh, attractive to, to pollinators, to, to bees. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think I pretty much see them on all those tree species that, that flower. With a true flower, you know, like oaks, those type of things flower, but, but really you don't see insects drawn to the catkins, those type of things. Bonnie uh, has a really old pin oak, and she's asking, when is a good time to plant a tree under it to start growing and replace it, or do you have to actually wait until the original tree is gone? That's a really good question. You know, uh, it just, you, if you're putting another large tree under it, sometimes it's kind of hard because they don't get enough sunlight to get them going. Uh, but if you've got a really thin high canopy, you, you could certainly try it. Uh, the problem is, you know, is, does the pin oak outlive when it needs to be removed, let the next tree grow? So putting another shade tree under a shade tree is a little bit more difficult and dicey to do. The farther you get away from it, out, you get outside the canopy, I would say go ahead and do it. But the problem is if that tree, you know, if it, you, you got to either be, are you going to bite the bullet and remove it to let that new tree grow? Or if you let that old tree set there, it's probably going to um, stunt the growth, destroy, you know, some of the shape of the tree, those type of things. That's a really hard question to answer. Um, cause it's just hard to put a, a, a shade tree under a shade tree cause they want the same conditions. That is, uh, that's it for the chat room for now. Okay. Well, I guess if there's any other questions that people want to either, uh, you know. Okay. Well, I'm done. You know, just talk, just let me know. Thank you. Okay. Well, if not, if there's no additional questions. And Dennis, your, uh, your presentation would be available at uh, the extension office. Yeah, what I have hopefully will do is I will record, I've recorded this presentation and we'll upload it to our uh, web, our web page, our YouTube page. And then I'll send uh, the tree board the link and you can then promote in your um, channels or I could send it out to those that register. We can send it out through the email and they have it that way either way or, or both, whatever works best. I think both okay. would be great, Dennis, yeah. Okay, well I hit uh, stop recording.